sake of emphasis, Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 19, and verses 26 through 28. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must become your minister, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Philippians 2 and 7, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. For a few moments, let us reason together from this subject What's so great about servant leadership? What's so great about servant leadership? Will you repeat that after me? What's so great about servant leadership? leadership. Thanks be to God that he has brought us in our faith journey to this day, this time, and this place. For we are engaging in an aspect of ministry that is extremely unique to us. We have learned in our walk with Christ that as we focus upon Jesus, he often leads us in a way that does not reflect what others are doing. For when you are following Jesus, you must also lose sight of other persons. The Bible says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For being a follower of Jesus Christ as a disciple involves everything that we have and everything that we are, which is why Jesus commands us, if you will come after me and be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. Now the cross has become glamorized over the past 2,000 years, but you and I must recognize that within the context that Jesus uttered these words about taking up your cross and following me, to even refer to the cross meant that you were using a term of terrorism and intimidation. Now, you don't really get anybody's skin ruffled or feathers ruffled when you say the cross because we put diamonds on a cross. We put gold, silver, pearls on a cross. We put them on gold chains and wear them. Nobody today is intimidated by the cross. But to put it in common 
everyday vernacular, what Jesus was saying is, if you want to be my disciple, take up your electric chair and follow me. I have never seen anybody take the image of an electric chair and cover it with gold. I've never seen anybody take an electric chair image and put it on a gold chain or put diamonds on it. Why? Because an electric chair still has that stigma. It still reminds us of how painful and shameful and ignominious and repulsive death by an electric chair can be. Whatever it is that we have done to glamorize the cross, there are still some believers who want nothing to do with the cross at all. There are so many churches where they sing nothing about the cross. They do not sing at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. They don't sing Jesus keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain free to all, a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. Christianity today has taken a leave of absence from the cross or the electric chair. Now we talk about prosperity. Now we talk about success. Now we talk about ecclesiastical ascendancy. Now we advertise conferences and conventions. Now we talk about getting ahead, soul winning, church building, expansion, demographics, but not much is said about the cross. Even so, even less is said about servant leadership. For you understand that servant leadership is not something that is often raised in most religious circles. Very few congregations, reformations, organizations, denominations talk about servant leadership. Why is it that this term is not regularly discussed or addressed? Well, you do understand that to even be involved in a discussion about servant or servant leadership means that you are having a kingdom discussion and not a church discussion. Servant leadership is not a church word. It's a kingdom word. And if you're into church and not kingdom, then servant leadership is something that will go right over your head. Remember, the theme says servant leadership, the kingdom standard for ministry. Most people are not into kingdom standards. They're into church activity. And if you are about church, then you walk to the beat of a different drummer than those who have a kingdom calling upon their lives. That means that you must have a radically different interpretation of Christ. You have to see Jesus as Jesus projected himself because Jesus was not a church leader. Jesus was not a church preacher. Jesus was not a church leader. In fact, while Jesus was ministering, there really was no church which is why Jesus has to make an announcement in Matthew 16, upon this rock, I will build my church. Look at the tense of his verb. He did not say, I have built the church, nor did he say, I am building 
the church. But Jesus, as he references the crucifixion, as he references death, he now can bring in church because the only way to have a church, Jesus has to die first. In order to have a church, he must go to Calvary first. In order to have a church, he has to hang on a cross with nails in his hands and feet, thorns upon his brow, a spear in his side. He must go into the grave. He must go into hell before that can be a church. No wonder he doesn't even talk about church until 16 chapters into the book of Matthew. You don't find anything about the word church in Matthew chapter 1, but you do find something about Jesus being Emmanuel, God with us, the Messiah, the anointed one. There's nothing in Matthew chapter 2 about church, but you do find wise men from non-European roots looking for him that is born king of the Jews. You don't find anything about church in Matthew chapter 3, but you do find an utterance from the Father. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. An introduction from John the Baptist that the Lord Jesus Christ is one whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose he shall baptize you not just with water, but with the Holy Ghost and fire. We find in Matthew 3, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 4, nothing about church, but Jesus in Matthew 4, 17, going about preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, you find nothing about church, but blessed are the poor in spirit, for they is the kingdom of God in Matthew 6 nothing about church but pray the kingdom our father who art in heaven thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven Matthew chapter 7 nothing about church but we do find in Matthew 7, he does not teach at the scribes and Pharisees, but he teaches as one who has authority. Matthew 13, nothing about church, but it's a word about the sower who goes and sows a seed with the seed, some falling on good ground, some falling in rocky places, some falling among the thorns. But thank God that some how some good seed fell on me. Jesus has to take 16 chapters building a kingdom message, building a kingdom model, building a kingdom message after 16 chapters of kingdom infrastructure. Finally, he starts talking about dying. And once he begins talking about dying and going to the cross and giving his life, that means that's the foundation for me to bring something that I've been pregnant with for a long time. Upon this rock, I will birth. Upon this rock, I will manifest. I will reveal. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And immediately after having used the term church, he goes back to kingdom. And I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I can't give you church keys yet because I have not built the church yet. I haven't been to the cross yet. I haven't been crucified yet. I haven't died yet. I haven't given my life yet. I have not been to hell yet. You can't build a church unless there's some hell. You may not be able to say amen to that. That might be a little too heavy for you. Let me take my time and talk to you on this official day of our 12th annual conference on servant leadership. I need to talk to you about the fact that if you are talking about church, church isn't really getting you ready for heaven. Church is getting you ready for hell. I dare you to shout and run down the aisle on that. 
Why is it that as soon as Jesus says upon this rock, I will build my church. What's next, Jesus? And the gates, not heaven, but and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Anybody knows that you ain't had no hell until you get involved with the church. I don't know why some people are uncomfortable talking about that. They want to talk about heaven. I'm on my way to heaven. Heaven is a wonderful place, but before you get to heaven, you're going to have to deal with some hell. That is why Jesus, in having this kingdom discussion, wants us to understand you never have church without kingdom. If I didn't have a kingdom, I couldn't manifest the church. If I wasn't the king, I wouldn't have the authority to reveal the church. If I didn't have the power of the kingdom, the anointing, the glory, the dunamis, the exusia of the kingdom, I couldn't discuss the church. But because I am the king of kings and lord of lords because I have all power. I can talk about something nobody else has ever said before and that's church. I said the church gets you ready for hell. Upon this rock I will build my church and because the church has kingdom infrastructure, because the kingdom infrastructure brings about Holy Ghost power, what is the kingdom? The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy where? In the Holy Ghost. You can deal with hell if you got some Holy Ghost power. You can preach in hell if you got some Holy Ghost power. You can shout in hell if you got Holy Ghost power. The church! Get you ready for hell. Look at somebody and ask them, you ready for hell? That's why after Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm going to give you some keys, but not church keys. Because you can't deal with church and hell if you ain't got some kingdom in you. He says to Nicodemus, nothing about the church, but except one be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You must have a kingdom experience. You must have kingdom life, kingdom understanding, kingdom purpose. Pray the kingdom, sing the kingdom, preach the kingdom. That's why some people can't discuss servant leadership because they never had a kingdom experience. And if you all up in the church and you've got that misunderstanding about church that you actually believe it's yours. And there are folk that will tell you, child, at my church or in my pulpit, well, I want you to understand what it takes to build a church. Just in case you want to start you a church, let me tell you what the qualifications are. You must be conceived by the Holy Ghost in a virgin called Mary. And then you've got to walk the dusty shores of Galilee, tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. You've got to go to a cross and die a horrible death. And then you've got to go into hell and get out of hell with all authority, just in case you want to start a church. And if you ain't never done that, church is God's intellectual property. Stop engaging in copyright infringement because the church doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Jesus. And so when you listen to Jesus talk about the kingdom, the kingdom is a governmental concept. The kingdom is about advancing God's authority worldwide. And you can't have a kingdom without force. You can't have a kingdom without power and army. You can't have a kingdom without resources, which is why you can't have a kingdom without 
servants. Servant leadership is not a church thing. It's a kingdom thing. That's why these disciples eased up on Jesus in a spirit of ventriloquism. We ain't got the nerve to ask you ourselves, but our mama does. I don't know why some people use their mama like that. And you call yourself a real man. But you're not man enough to look Jesus in the face and further the other disciple and tell him, I want your title. I want your position. I want your job. I want to replace you. And the best way for me to do that is get on your right hand and on your left hand. Now, I don't have the nerve to say it myself, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to channel my voice through my mama. And my mama's going to ease up to you and get on her knee. Oh, Jesus, you so wonderful, sweet Jesus, lovable Jesus. And Jesus realized there's a little something different about this. What do you want? Because you saying something, but ain't really you, your Voice is coming from another source. Your lips are moving, but somebody else's voice is doing the speaking. So I really should say, what y'all want? <laughs> and here's what we want, Jesus. Martin Luther King called it a drum major instinct. We want to be in front of everybody else. We want to be in control of everybody else and that's why you need to ask the question what's different about servant leadership what's great about servant leadership is in the text if you want to know what's different let me show you leader and then let me show you servant leader Matthew 20 18 Jesus said we're going up to Jerusalem and when we get there, the Son of Man will be delivered to the leaders, chief priests, the leaders, rulers of the law, rulers of the synagogue, of the temple. The leaders will condemn him to death. The leaders will hand him over to Gentiles who will mock him and scourge him and crucify him. The leaders are against him. The leaders, when Jesus marches into Jerusalem and people take off their garments and take trees from branches and put them in the way and say help us now save us now send now prosperity singing the hymn of Psalm 118 the leaders got upset the leaders became indignant the leaders said make your people be quiet there's a profound difference in leaders and servant leaders this is what leaders do. Leaders believe in consolidating or accessing power by any means necessary, even if it means using your mama to try to manipulate Jesus. Here's what a leader does. A leader sends his mama and says, I want my boys. I don't care a thing about Peter, Matthew, Bartholomew. Not another disciple. I want my boys right next to you. That's what you call leadership. And that's why the Bible says God has a problem with leadership because he says the leaders have caused my people to error. Jesus called it blind leading the blind. What's different about servant leadership? Well, what did Jesus say about servant leadership? After having been approached by a whole family that wants to monopolize God's kingdom, and they said it right after Jesus said, I'm going to the cross. Right after he said, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be put to death. They said nothing about his suffering, nothing about his crucifixion, nothing about his cross. But I do want a position. You a leader, and people want leaders, not servant leaders. People want, for some strange reason, those who manipulate them and look down their nose at folk. I don't understand why anybody would follow 
the one that we had for president the past four years. But there are people even now who are still willing to lay down their lives for a false leader. He's still lying, saying that the election was stolen. The persons who engaged in that insurrection on January the 6th are yet being arrested and charged. And even this year, there was a conference where there was a golden image of Mr. Trump. And his followers came and paid homage to his golden image. The problem was Christian conservative leaders said not one word about it. What kind of leader are you? You say that you're with God, but you too jelly back to talk against someone making a brazen image of themselves, and you act like it never happened. I want you to understand, going to be a lot of leaders in the lake of fire because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, leaders are going to come to him and say, I preached in your name. I laid hands on the sick in your name. I cast out devils in your name. What Jesus going to say to the leaders? I don't know you. Yes, you did lead some folk, and you had some followers, and you built some houses, and you made some money, and you got some fame and glory. You better let them give you a heaven because you ain't coming in mine. Depart from me, you that lead people astray. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. There's a difference between a leader and a servant. That's why the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, Jesus chose to be a servant. Even though he was in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he did not use divinity to his advantage. He didn't use his authority, his position, his power to get him ahead. I want to go to the bottom. I want to live in poverty. I want to say the foxes have holes, the birds of air have nests, the son of man nowhere to lay his head. I want to die a criminal's death. I want to be numbered with the homeless because I'm not a leader. I'm a servant. It's time for us to examine ourselves. It's a new year. It's a new beginning. We've come through 18 months of a pandemic. We've been put out of our own cathedral, forced to preach for 12 months in the elements. We met people we never would have preached to if God hadn't put us out. On the sidewalk, people were being saved. On the streets, people were being introduced to Christ. God said, get out of this house. Get off your cushion pew. Get off that carpet and preach in the streets. That's what we've been doing for the past 12 months. We heard the call to servant leadership. And as we were responding with the yes, Lord, in our spirit, who but leaders came to us and said, y'all crazy. Don't you know it's cold outside? Don't you know it's snowing? Did you know it was ice? Don't you know it's rain outside? But don't you know Jesus suffered more than that on a cross for you? Don't you know Jesus gave his life for you and you can't give up a cushion pew to worship God on the street? I dare you to shout. We didn't get here accidentally. God brought us through the storm. God brought us through adversity. God brought us from internal conflict. God brought us through the COVID-19 struggle. He brought us even when people were on the sideline waiting and hoping for us to fail, predicting that we would fail. They go stay out there. Child, they'll be back in when the weather get cold. And before you get back up and say anything, you ought to repent because you know you told that, even got on Facebook and talked about us. You end up there, maybe too heavy for you to say, man, just say, hmm. There's a difference between a leader 
and a servant. Beware of leaders in the clique. Leaders got them a little pew group. Leaders got them a little email list. Leaders got them a little text chain. Well, they can make little snide comments. Child, I ain't going back up in there. We better be careful. Because you got to stand before God one day. You got to look Jesus in the eyes and tell him why you went to Acme. Rite Aid, CVS, Walmart, Walgreens, Cheesecake Factory. But you couldn't come to church. You better be careful. You're going to be in hell. I said there's a difference between a leader and a servant leader. And that's the reason why I don't like going to leadership conferences. It's in leadership conferences, there are leaders that say how to win friends and influence people. Dale Carnegie, that's a leader not a servant, how to succeed in business without really trying as a leader. Get rich or die trying, 50 cent, as a leader. There's some leaders out there, and they got some followers. Don't you know, young men, don't just Say, I believe I'll wear my pants below my waist today so folk can see my underwear unless they got some blind leaders, some twisted leaders that say that you should carry yourself in a disrespectful manner. We got the wrong folk leading our children, the wrong folk singing to our children rap music, gangster rap music that refers to women in derogatory term, and you paying for iPods so that your children can listen to it in your house. Be careful about who's leading your child. Be careful about who's speaking to, who's texting your children. We got leaders out there that cause our children on Instagram to want to play a choking game. See how long you can go without breathing. Teenagers innocently dying, bullying on the internet because we got leaders but not servant leaders. You may not like the sermon, but you sure enough ain't going to forget the sermon. <laughs> that is why Jesus says, it shall not be so among you. Don't you know that's a rebuke to a foul spirit of manipulation, a Jezebel spirit of control, a false prophet spirit of deception. Jesus said, we're not going to lead like that here. Listen to what Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew chapter 20. He says to them in the 24th verse, after James and John Mama had put him on the spot and the 10 disciples were ready to come to blows, Jesus brought them all together and sat them down and said, you know what leaders do. The leaders, rulers of the Gentile, lord it over them. Their high officials exercise authority over them. Some people never let you forget, I'm in charge. I'm the one that's got the office. I got the position. I'm the one with power. And every time you hear somebody reminding you, um, this, um, that, is because they are insecure. <laughs> Insecure people need to remind themselves, I'm somebody, I got some power, I got some authority, I can look down on some folks, I can kick some people around, I can walk on people, I can push them around. You a leader, but you're going to lead yourself and others to hell. I don't want you. I want a servant. 
I want somebody that'll speak to me. I want somebody that'll smile at me sometimes. I want somebody that'll pray for me. I want somebody that can hear from God. I want a servant. Say yes. This is why Jesus draws the line. It's a matter of kingdom authority. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the reason why you don't hear many people discussing this is because it's a judgment passage. The time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. But if you're going to be judged, I'd rather be judged at God's house than to be judged at the courthouse. Too many crooked lawyers, too many crooked judges in the courthouse. You see, that's why I'm glad God judged me at his house at the altar because I've been pulled over before. I've been profiled before. I was driving and the officer said, now the reason why I pull you over, because I've seen cars just like this one with $300,000 cash, drug money in the trunk. And I didn't reach for nothing, put my hands up and said, officer, you are free to search this car. You can search under the seat. You can search under the mat in the trunk. You can search the engine. You can search the tires. Reason why I knew how to talk to the officer, I'd already been judged in God's house. I said to the officer, I don't mind. If you want to take me in, I give my hand, put them on me. I don't have a problem submitting to your authority because the Bible told me that you are God's minister, God's servant. And I, I'm praying for you right now because you're in God's hand. The old folks said he got the whole world in his hands. And he did look in the trunk. He looked all over and he had to let me go because he didn't know I've already been judged in God's house. I don't wait till I get to the jailhouse for judgment. I don't wait till I get to the courthouse. I've been to God's house. I don't have to wait till you issue a warrant for my arrest. Jesus already had a warrant for my arrest. I turned myself in at God's altar. I came to Jesus as I was weary, worn, and sad. I found in him a resting place. Jesus! has made me glad. And because I was already judged at God's house, I could say to the officer, I tell you what, I volunteer for a drug test. I'm ready right now to give you a drop. I, I don't have any problem with, look, I'll do a urine test. I'll do a blood test because I guarantee you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I'm drug free. <laughs> I've already been judged at God's house. And because judgment must begin at the house of God, the question rises, where shall the sinner and ungodly appear? I'm glad God has already judged me. This is a scripture of judgment. It shall not be so among you. You cannot lead like the world leads. Don't be a leader that puts people down. Don't be a leader that steps on people. Don't be a leader that throws your weight around. Don't be a leader that's stuck on him or herself. But if you humble yourself, in due time, God will exalt you. Oh, Lord, thank God that Jesus is calling for servant leaders. He wants somebody who will kneel down at his feet. For the Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace. And if you do that, you'll find grace to help you in the time of need. Well, somebody might want to know, how did you get involved with servant leadership? Well, let me testify. Let me get on the stand. You see, I knew that Jesus said, be a servant, but I had not yet been introduced to the concept academically of servant leadership. But I was 
preaching in a former parish in Michigan and a few blocks away from the church, a young man, 17 years old, named Christopher Ricketts, was murdered in his new Suzuki SUV. What was different about Christopher Ricketts? As a child, he had an accident with a manufacturer's toy, and it made him blind in one of his eyes. His attorney settled with the company's insurance, and he received a million-dollar settlement. But he couldn't access it until he was 18 years old. But he was 17 when he was driving his new Suzuki on the north side of Kalamazoo. And he was the victim of an attempted carjacking. Young man walked up to him and pointed the gun in his face and said, give it up. And instead of him giving over his SUV, he hit the gas pedal speeding down the street and the young man just aimed at him and fired. He didn't know whether he'd hit anything or not, but it ended up he hit him in his heart. And the young man practically dies on the spot. Then the family came to the church where I pastored and said, we don't belong to this church. We're not a member of this congregation, but we've seen you in the community. We've heard you preaching all over town. You're the only pastor we know. We're not your members, but will you let us have our son's funeral in your church? over the objection of congregational leaders who reminded me they don't tithe here, they don't give offerings here, they don't even visit here. Why should we open our church to people who aren't even members? But the fact is the church is the only organism that is designed for the benefit of its non-member. Oh, Lord. So I went out on a limb and said, yes, I want to serve your family. I know you're hurting. It could have been my son. It could have been a member of my family. Yes, I'm not going to let you hurt by yourself. Come on in. We're going to grieve together. The news media was there, not because of teen violence, but because there was a million-dollar insurance policy on the young man's life. And after I did the funeral, I went to the city commission and had a fit on them because not one elected official even gave a condolence to the family. Not one commissioner, not the clerk, not the administrator, not the mayor even said, I wish the family would be comforted in this hour. I said, you know that teen violence is epidemic in our community. Don't think that just because you live in the suburbs that violence won't find its way to your house. And the next time it happened, they came and stood with me at the casket of another victim of violence. Eventually, we got a black woman mayor, and she said, in response to your plea, Pastor Felton, we're going to develop an advisory council on violence prevention among our teens. Gave us a budget of $20,000, and then her husband husband moved because his job relocated him and she recommended me to be on the Kalamazoo Community Foundation which has nearly half a billion dollar endowment. They accepted me but in the interview process they had couple billionaires on the board and they said to me are you comfortable around rich people? <laughs> 
Are you all right around people of wealth? And I said, yes, because my father is rich in houses and land. He holds the wealth of the world in his hand. The president said, come on in my office. And when I sat down at his office, he had a book on his desk by Robert K. Greenleaf called Servant Leadership. And I said to Jack Hopkins, I want you to loan me that book. I want to read about it. And Jack Hopkins said, I'm not going to loan it to you. I'm going to give it to you. And from that point on, I became convicted about the impact of servant leadership. In the book that we'll consult in servant leadership for congregations, it states that servant leadership didn't begin with Greenleaf, and it didn't begin with Kent Halstead, but it began with a man called Jesus, who said, he that would be great among you, let him become your servant. Oh, Lord, even as president of the Ministerial Alliance, I leveled the playing field and said what we all are are servants. I let people from the community become a part of the Ministerial Alliance because I said to them, what you have is a ministry. You don't have a position. You don't have a job. You have a ministry. And wherever God put you, he's expecting you to answer to him. And out of that, even the chief of police became a member of the ministerial alliance because of Romans 13. We prayed for the chief and went 400 days without one murder in the whole city. I know it works. I'm a living example that it works. God is able. In fact, not only is he able, but he's able to do exceeding abundantly above of all you can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Jesus wants you to know there's power in being a servant. There's power in humbling yourself. There's power in submitting your life to God's will. There's power in saying yes Lord there's power in loving your brother and sister there's power in forgiving one another I want to hear him say well done thou good and faithful servant oh you've been faithful in a few things you've been faithful when you talked about you been faithful when you didn't have a dime in your pocket. You've been faithful in season and out of season. Oh, you've been faithful when trouble was raging, when storms were blowing in your life. Come on up a little higher. There are some promotions that can only come from God. Promotion don't come from the east. Promotions don't come from the west. Promotions don't come from the north or from the south. But God is your promoter. God will take you higher. God will make you the head and not the tail. God will make you the top and not the bottom. If you humble yourself, you got a promotion coming. If you said the Lord, you got a promotion coming. Oh, Lord. If you are faithful through good times and bad through lean times as well as the good time you got a promotion coming come on and wave your hand at somebody tell them be faithful God's got a promotion waiting on you give God some praise hallelujah help me shout hallelujah 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 glory hallelujah God is not calling for leaders. He's calling for servant leaders. 
And I know that there are still people who you can't even get them to use the term servant leader. I know that. I know that there are spirits that resist being a servant because pride is a strong spirit. But pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. You better mind how you treat people. But you got to meet a God for yourself. Let's pray. The door is open. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. For you made a statement of judgment. You demanded that we lead differently from the world. Save us from trying to bring the world into the church. Save us from trying to run the church as if it were a Fortune 500 corporation. The church is different. Even when we have mega funds, even when we only have a few people, you still move by your power. For you said if two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Jesus, I feel you here right now. I feel your mercy. I feel your love. I feel your grace. Jesus, we honor you today because you're the head of the church. And we love you with all of our hearts. Hallelujah. Somebody help me praise God. Hallelujah. 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 We love you today. The doors of the church are open. Somebody may have been touched by the Spirit of God. Somebody may have been touched by the love of God. A God who loved us enough to die for us, to take our place on Calvary, who had enough power that death couldn't keep him, the grave couldn't hold him. Because he was a servant, God has highly exalted him. And given him a name that is above every name, that at the name, not a name, but at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, every eye shall see that he's Lord. This is Bishop J. Lewis Felton thanking you for joining us for the Mount Airy Kingdom Worship Experience. May you continue to partner with us as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. We love you in Jesus' name.